All right, let's, uh, let's get started. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to reInvent 2018. I hope you all had a good uh, holiday last week and are enjoying the reInvent sessions this afternoon. My name is Shilpa Mehta, and I'm going to be co-presenting AIML with Data, uh, data Lakes, a counterintuitive uh, consumer insight into retail, along with Fabio Luzzi from Tapestry and Paul Fryer from Amazon Web Services. In this session, we are going to be talking about building the best practices to build a good uh, and intelligent data lake uh, to support a good retail data platform, the reasons, uh, uh, reasons behind developing uh, a good, robust uh, da uh, data platform. We'll also be talking about uh, taking, uh, getting a maximum value out of your data so that you can um, uh, train your data for uh, machine learning models and algorithms. Uh, Fabio will then be talking about uh, Tapestry's journey to becoming a more data-driven and a prediction-driven um, uh, company. And then we will, do a, uh, we will have a demo on SageMaker for, uh, for continuous uh, uh, model, uh, tra model, model training. <coughs> so when we talk about building a, a retail data platform or creating an data, intelligent data lake, one of the first things that comes to mind is why do we need to do that? Uh, many of the uh, existing, uh, existing uh, uh, projects already have architectures that have been built with traditional software. But uh, over the years, over the past two decades, what we have seen is that um, customers have to start changing the way that they've been traditionally doing business. Uh, the way consumers are buying using uh, mobile technology or the, uh, because of the uh, advent of inter internet, people have started to change the way they are doing uh, buying products and services. At the same time, technology has allowed e-commerce, uh, the rise of e-commerce has allowed uh, uh, retail, uh, uh, retailers to reach out to a new segment, a bigger segment and a global segment of customers and are able to uh, uh, provide better experiences for their customers. Um, as uh, more and more companies are uh, starting to realize that uh, that as time goes by, they have to continuously uh, uh, transform their customer experience and their businesses so that they can stay competitive. Cost is, of course, a very, very important uh, driving factor, but one of the biggest factors that is driving customers to change the way, or uh, retailers to change the way that they are doing business is because of the agility and the innovation that they require. They want to be agile, they want to be innovative so that they can keep giving better and better customer experiences to their, um, uh, to their end users. So, uh, as I said earlier, uh, most of our customers have, be, uh, have, be, have uh, already built uh, analytical projects uh, using traditional architecture, big architecture uh, with traditional software and have been building projects on top of that. But, uh, th but th those architectures are now in this new age, day and age, have become more cumbersome, more expensive and not easy to innovate upon. A good modern retail data platform requires the ability to be able to get data from all sides, to ingest that data, to be able to uh, put that data in one particular durable place uh, so instead of having multiple platforms or silos to store that data. You also need to have a bunch of uh, analytical tools, a variety of uh, analytical tools that will allow you to process all that data that you're getting from different sources so that you can get maximum value out of that data. And finally, you want to have the ability to have that data that has been analyzed interact with both internal apps as well as customer-facing applications. Uh, AWS uh, offers a, diff, uh, a whole bunch of services in that entire pipeline that spans from in, uh, for uh, if, uh, that spans both uh, from the ingestion perspective into the storage, into the collection, the data collection area, into the uh, uh, processing, and then uh, for consumption of that data. It is important to build processes that are going to be reusable. You do not want to have to, to be agile. You have to be quick. You have to be able to scale fast. And you need to reuse your processes so that you don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can keep moving forward with different uh, places. So before we dive into the 
uh, into actually building an architecture. What we need to understand is what are the processes or the best practices that we need to uh, uh, set up before actually building a big data uh, uh, project. And one of the biggest things, most important uh, piece of a retail data platform is the data. We have a lot of data today. Uh, most, um, uh, most, uh, uh, most of the customers say that we have lots of data today. Tomorrow, we are going to, in five years, we are going to have an incredible amount of data. And in about 20 years, we are going to have unimaginable uh, amounts of data. So yes, what are we going to do with that data? It's going to cost a lot to store that data. And how much value are we getting out of that data? Many of the legacy systems, CRM systems, you have a lot of data that is already sitting there, but we are not getting value out of it because we don't know how to use that data. So the cost is very high. But the value that you get, need to get out of that data is only a subset of that entire data seg uh, segment. It's just a, a very small segment. So it, is very so it is very important to understand what data is required for a good analytical, um, uh, for good analytical and business decisions. And there are customers who already have that data, and there are some customers who are trying to uh, figure out what data they will need to build their businesses. So to understand what data is required, it's a very simple process. Each business needs to understand their customer. They need to understand who their customer is, get a one view into the customer insight, and understand what, uh, what is going on. And how do you find that data? So the data that, uh, one of the biggest ways to find, best ways to find data is by finding what a co consumer is purchasing. When you do a shopping cart analysis, you can get a lot of information about your customer. You get information about uh, the age of the customer. You can find out what kind of products they are buying. Based upon that, you can figure out if there are any health issues in the household, if there are any kids in the household. And built, based upon that, you can build good recommendation engines so that you can offer new products based upon pricing or the quali uh, qualities that that consumer is looking for. So that's one data set. We have examples of customers like Instacart who have used this. Uh, they have very uh, rapidly, uh, Instacart is a company that uh, sells online grocery to uh, their consumers. And they have built these recommendation, uh, recommendation engines based upon, the, uh, the shop on, uh, based upon data they're getting from their shopping cart analysis. Another important place where you can get a lot of information about a customer is based upon their movement. Uh, these days, whenever you download an app or you install a new application, what is the first thing it, it asks you? It asks you if you, uh, you're willing to share your location. Based upon the location, <coughs> retailers can make very strategic business de de decisions. They can decide if they want to actually uh, build a new store based upon the social economic um, uh, level of that particular um, area. Or maybe they don't. Uh, uh, they know what kind of products are being required in that area, so they can build, uh, uh, have a, create a very strong business uh, value out of this information. And uh, DXL is uh, another example. It's a men's apparel company, and they had to decide whether they wanted to build a new store in a certain location, and they used location data in AWS to be able to uh, figure out whether they wanted to uh, build it over there. And finally, the customer that, uh, that you're working with or the customer that you, uh, you are uh, trying to understand, the, the connections that that customer makes is also very important. If you can find one customer who is an expert, say, on art or, um, uh, or fashion or transport, that one person's ideas can ripple over to a, a bigger community. And because that person is an expert in that area, a bigger community will start uh, uh, taking their ideas, and you can reach out to a bigger community or bigger customer base. Um, Find Arts is another example that has uh, used data from uh, based upon connections of a customer. So we have all these examples over here, and we have all this data. But if you think of the cost of uh, if you think of the cost of, of saving all this data or storing all this data, it is exorbitant. And there is no one company that can get a universal uh, data, uh, get all this data and store it easily. So how do you do that? How do you move forward with it? How do you build an uh, analytics platform based upon this? So the place to start 
is not with the data. In the past, we have always talked about data as being the first thing. If you have the data, you can solve certain challenges. But that is not the place to start. The place to start is within the organization to look for the different metrics that are available. So most retailers are looking to get a better revenue uh, increase, uh, market competition. They want to get information about brand advocacy, inventory optimization from an operational perspe uh, perspective. So you need to break down all the challenges. Instead of trying to solve one big uh, problem, break down the metrics. So if you take brand advocacy, for instance, uh, you want to, uh, brand advocacy is usually measured by um, NPS, which is the net, uh, uh, the net, promo uh, net promotion score. And uh, an organization decides that I want to increase my brand advocacy. What do I do? So that's when you go back to, your da uh, to the places from where you're getting your data. It could be based upon uh, coming from the internet. It could be from your databases, mm -hmm. CRM <laughs> systems, or through uh, the influencers. You get that data. You find the minimal amount of data that is really required to test your hypotheses. Once you figure out that that's the data you want, the next thing you do is build a very simple, uh, a minimal infrastructure. Uh, just the minimal amount that you will need to store your data, to create a data lake. The minimal amount of computer processing that you will need to actually process that data that you have and test your hypotheses and provide the results to your business outcome. So if you can look at this from a perspective of a template, you can use this for all the different metrics, the same process again and again iteratively for all the different metrics that you want to change. So if you look at it uh, from a template perspective, what you can do is then, once you have a process in place that works, you can uh, continue to build many more um, uh, templates uh, based upon your ideas, based upon experimentation, and that's the best part about the cloud. You can actually keep building your um, ideas and experiments quickly. You have the agility in, uh, in the AWS cloud. You can quickly spin up thousands of servers uh, within minutes and start testing. And if there is, and like uh, every organization, if you have 100 ideas out of that, uh, there is only a small percentage of successful ideas. So you take those successful ideas and you can continue to scale them and put them in production. But the ones that fail, you do not have to live with the collateral of that damage. What you can do is just turn off the services, stop paying for them, and you do not, ha and you do not have any artifacts left over. In the old days in the data center, you would have capital expenses. You would not be able to innovate as fast. You would have to get uh, to experiment. You would have to get budget. You would have to get the hardware, software, and then r uh, run with it. In the cloud, that's the difference. You don't need to do that anymore. So th being able to create a process, make a template out of it, test it, and if it's successful, move it into the area, yeah, move it into production, move it into a uh, scale it, or if it fails, just stop the experiment and move on to the next one. That is the essence of a good data lake or a good retail data platform. So what goes underneath these templates in the AWS cloud? As I said, we have uh, for the entire pipeline, right from the ingestion to the storing of the data to analyzing the data as well as to consume the data, we have all, we have services for each and every uh, uh, for each and every area. For the ingestion, you're getting data from Clickstream. You're getting IoT data. We have uh, we have the capability of ingesting uh, streaming data using Kinesis family. We, uh, you can connect your uh, you you can connect your data centers directly to your VPC or virtual private cloud or the data center in the AWS uh, uh, cloud. So, so that you can uh, let, uh, bring in data from your CRM systems, or you can connect to your old uh, databases or data warehouses. And then we have uh, appliances like Snowball, where we can actually send you an appliance, you um, uh, uh, copy your data over, send it to us, and we put it into the data lake. You can store your data in our simple storage service, S3, which is extremely durable, extremely scalable, and extremely cheap. So you can move all your data, doesn't matter where it's coming from, in one particular place. Now that you have all these objects and all these media files, log files, uh, clickstream data in your buckets, uh, you need to un understand what that data is. 
And for that, we have a, uh, we have a cataloging service called Glue, which can go into your S3 bucket and uh, create a metadata uh, repository as to what kind of data you have in there. And once that is done, you can move uh, glue. Uh, you can use glue or even third-party uh, products, but we support those. But glue can uh, move all this data, all that data into uh, the, the analytical tool of your choice. So it could be the Redshift data warehouse. It could be uh, EMR, which is a Hadoop framework uh, managed service, and Amazon Athena, which is a serverless ad hoc query tool. Or you can and you can send it to QuickSight, which is our visualization tool. And then we have a lot of machine learning services that I'll talk about on the next slide that can be utilized. And then you can connect this analyzed data to various internal apps as well as customer facing applications. So once a customer, yes? We are going to take questions at the end, but yes. <coughs> So once, we get, uh, once a customer reaches this level of maturity and is able to build that, the next thing is to continue to get more value out of your data, to be able to create a prediction-driven, a sentiment analysis-driven um, uh, uh, company, right? So for that, we have a stack of a machine, uh, we have a machine learning stack of services. And if you look at the bottom, we, have, we offer, of course, infrastructure, right? Uh, you have to have infrastructure uh, for, um, and we offer virtual machines. Uh, P3 is NVIDIA's um, uh, GPU-based uh, virtual machine that we offer. As you all know, deep learning requires a lot of um, a, a lot of GPU power, and that is provided through this P3 machine. We also have a bunch of Amazon machine images. So these are EC2 instances that come uh, uh, with built uh, with a, a pre built a, a prepackaged uh, frameworks already on them. So you just spin them up, and then you can start uh, get on your machine learning pr uh, uh, journey. Well, uh, we support all sorts of frameworks, uh, all, everything that is listed over here from. Uh, Pyrotech, uh, TensorFlow, and if our customers tell us that they need more frameworks, we are happy to work with them and make sure that those also get supported. We are constantly listening to uh, customers, so we are happy to get that feedback. And then we also have some platforms, uh, uh, platform services and solutions. Amazon SageMaker, that is a, a platform service to, where you can actually build De uh, test and deploy uh, all sorts of model, uh, uh, mo uh, train model, uh, data models and algorithms, and you can uh, 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 and you can uh, uh, visualize that or explore that data through the through a Jupyter notebook that is included with SageMaker. SageMaker supports many, uh, of all the uh, all the various frameworks uh, that are available, and we are c continuing to integrate more and more in there. We also have what we call the Amazon Mechanical Turk which is a crowdsourcing marketplace offering. What it does is it allows organizations to reach out to a global community to leverage their skills. And these skills could be as simple as taking a survey, or it could be uh, more detailed research. So Amazon uh, Machine Turk, you're actually using people as code to get your tasks done. And you're reaching out to a, a big community of people uh, beyond your organization. And then we have the Amazon Deep Learning AMI, which again comes uh, built in with the deep learning algorithms and models. And then for people who do not want to deal with the complexity of actually building up models or algorithms, we have services at the top, which are the application services. These are API-based applications. So we have Amazon recognition for vi uh, video recognition. Uh, CNN used it during Prince Harry's uh, uh, wedding to re uh, uh, while they were streaming the wedding. Uh, uh, the celebrities that were there, they were, uh, re recognition was used for that. Uh, we have Amazon Polly, which does tech, um, uh, which does text to speech uh, translation. We have Transcribe, which does uh, speech to text, and then com uh, Translate actually translates different languages for you, so you can create chatbots. Or um, if you have sales organizations in the different parts of the country, you can uh, you are able to um, uh, translate those languages and have an understanding. Amazon Comprehend is, uh, picks out certain uh, uh, sent, uh, certain um, sentences or words with, uh, uh, in, in text and can highlight those for you. So if you want to do sentiment analysis, uh, Comprehend is a good way to do it. And then we have Amazon Lex, which is similar to uh, which does audio conversion. 
So we have this deep stack over here. And when you integrate it with the analytical services, what you end up having is a good AI ML workflow. And an AI ML workflow allows, starts with data acquisition and storage. We talked about the ingestion methods earlier. Uh, data labeling, you can use something like Amazon Mechanical Turk to actually do that labeling for you instead of having, it's a very tedious process to go through your data and label it so that you can use it for modeling. And something like um, a Mechanical Turk could help you do that. Uh, model and framework selection, you can use SageMaker and then decide uh, which algorithm or which framework you want to use. And once you've decided that, you can start training your model. You can start using hyperparameter tuning to make it work better. Um, and you can do uh, model testing and simulation. And you can keep doing this iteratively till you're sure that it's going to work well. You deploy it and then keep monitoring and uh, uh, keep monitoring it. And it doesn't end there. The more data that keeps coming in, it keeps going through this process again and again and again. And the more data you have, the more information, the more accuracy you get. So uh, you can build these services very easily. And what happens when you get th to this level? You can start addressing different types of challenges that, are, uh, that most organizations are, face are uh, facing. Uh, the first is modernize and uh, consolidation. Like I said, we have a lot of le customers who have legacy environments. You can use these tools once you have a good retail uh, platform. Once you have a good retail platform, you can migrate your environments into this and start using better processes. You can in innovate for new revenues, uh, personalization, demand forecasting, risk analysis. Uh, Real-time engagement, um, we have Macy, which is a security tool, which is a machine learning uh, security tool. It keeps watching your data, figures out what is sensitive data, PII data, and it, uh, keeps a watch on it if uh, there is some kind of anomaly or uh, it looks like somebody is uh, trying to break into that data, you can get alerts based on that. So real-time fraud detection is possible. And then automa uh, automate for expansive reach. This is another very important uh, business process and, uh, for your physical infrastructure. You can keep expanding easily, scale easily. So uh, you can build a very robust retail platform based upon how you uh, decide to move forward with it, how you build your processes, and then how you use the AWS services that are available to you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Fabio from Tapestry, who has uh, uh, who is leading his company in this journey towards uh, a, a better t uh, retail platform. So. Thank you, Shilpa. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. So my name is Fabio Luzzi. I lead the Data Labs team in Tapestry. And for those of you who are not familiar with the company, uh, Tapestry is, the, is a multi-house brand in the fashion retail industry. So we own Coach, Kate Spade, and Stuart Weitzman. So today, what I would like to do, I would like to, to tell you about a journey that we initiated in Tapestry about six months ago, and it's a journey about transformation. So it's not a disruptive trans transformation, so we don't want to be, we didn't want to be disruptive, but it's a transformation that will bring incremental innovation. So what's the transformation about? So the idea is, how do you take a company that traditionally it's not a data-driven company, so it's not a company built on data like the Google, the Facebook of the world, but it's a company with a lot of data. So how do you leverage those data and uh, transform the company to make it more a data-driven and predictive-driven company? So this slide here really uh, paint the, the overall uh, vision, right? So we start from a place where obviously we are very good at looking back and trying to explain what's happening. So, you know, very good with hindsight and insight. So, you know, we're very good at being descriptive and diagnostic. We can answer questions like what is, what is happening and why we can even try to answer why it's happening. But the idea is to be more predictive. Uh, why? Because we want to, to inform our strategies, wherever they are across the organization, um, in advance. So you are not reactive, you don't take action when it's already too late, but you can anticipate the problem in advance and then you know, inform your strategy in advance. Um, so the idea is to be more predictive, be able to answer questions like what will happen in the future, what should I do about it, and then even, you know, a lot of people say we don't know what we don't know, so we even want to be able to, by using cognitive and AI to find out um, what are the things that I was not even considering and then could have an impact on, 
on the bottom line. So this is the vision for the transformation, right? So how do, you, how do we do it? So obviously, spoiler alert, it's not easy, right? So there, there are different elements that go into it. Today, we will focus on the technical framework that we set up in place in order to take the company to the next level. But obviously there are different elements, right? So there are what I say two prerequisites that you need to have. So obviously you need to have data and you need to have use cases. If you, then, if you don't have data, there's no point in building this. It's like, you know, it's, like, it's like building a Ferrari, but then you keep it parked in the parking lot because you don't have gas to run it. So obviously you need to have data. And according to my experience, if you have data, you probably have use cases. So once you have those two prerequisites, then what, what is it that you need to put in place in order to be more predictive? So obviously you need good people with good skills. You need to organize your teams in the right way so they can interact easily with other uh, organizational group, IT, and so forth. You need the technical framework, which we'll uh, uh, talk about in more details today. Uh, you need processes, right? So you need to have processes in, in place so your people know how to use the technical infrastructure to address the use cases by using the data that you have. And then last, but probably the most important thing, you need company culture. So you need to work in a company where the decision makers are willing to embrace this data-driven uh, approach. So if you have all that, then you can, you can become more predictive. So today, as I said, we're going to focus, I'll tell you more about the technical framework that we set up uh, with help of AWS to be, to be able to, to reach that vision, right? So we want to be more predictive, more prescriptive, and we want to be, to be uh, able to run AI um, capabilities. So the first thing that we need to have in place, as also Shilpa mentioned, is data lake. So we need to have a first landing zone where you put all your data. Obviously, you know, you start from... Uh, um, from your proprietary data, you know, for, for, for retail, you know, most of your data obviously come from POS and e-commerce, but then based on your use cases, you start gathering more data. Um, you know, there could be uh, anything, weather data, social media, engagement data, movement data, you name it. But it's important to have one place where you're ready to ingest the data that, that you need to address those use cases. Then how do you extract, how do you leverage the data? How do you extract insight from the data? You need to set up a framework where you can run your machine learning and AI models. And we'll talk about that too. And then lastly, how do you deliver? How do you make sure that the user can easily access those insights? You create self-service platform, right? So the user can, uh, can, uh, auto can alone just go in, log in, and take advantage of, 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 of all the framework that, we, that you created. So this is the conceptual framework. How, do, how did we translate this into a physical uh, structure that exists on the cloud? So basically, this is, this is a, a high-level map of what we build on the cloud, which basically mirror what we've been, ta what we've been talking uh, about so far. So as you can see, if you read it from the left, we have the data lake. So the data lake is basically a bunch of S3 where we ingest all of our proprietary data, but then where we are also ready to, to drop whatever data we need to address our use cases. And then uh, there are two other main areas that we created. One to, 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 let, to basically uh, deploy all our machine learning and uh, AI capabilities, and one other area to uh, build all the data tools where basically we store all the um, insights and we make it available to the users. Another, thing that I w another important thing that I wanted to mention about this schema is that you know, one of our main um, prerequisites was to be uh, secure. So we needed to build a cloud framework that was secure. And uh, uh, AWS make, make that very easy. So we, we probably have like six or, six or seven different layers of security in this cloud framework between VPN, VPC, um, subnets, you know, the routing tables, security groups, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a pretty secure uh, cloud framework. It's so secure that sometimes I cannot even get into it. <laughs> okay, so now, now I wanted to uh, show you, so how do, in order to make this more real and more tangible, I wanted to show you a couple of use cases 
so the first use case is about a tool, a data tool that we built. And I think this is a great example of um, how easy it is to deploy data tools given the infrastructure that we put in place. This, this tool uh, it basically uses everything that we talked about. So he used data lakes. He, he, uh, he, the main data source for this tool are uh, data that are sitting in S3 packets or in more structured data sets, like, uh, databases like Redshift. He uses the machine learning uh, framework because some of this output is powered by models that pre-run in the background. And obviously, the tool itself is a UI platform that the user can, uh, can access um, as a self-service tool. And this is a tool that ran, so it was built on ta in Tableau. It's a Tableau server, uh, just to give a little bit of te technicality. So it's a, it's a Tableau server that runs on an EC2, connects to S3 and Redshift um, for the data. So, oh, I forgot to click. So anyway, anyway so this is a video. So, uh, so the tool is called Falcon. It's basically uh, a multi-channel and uh, multi-brand tool. And the idea is to be able to, um, to monitor the performance of the physical stores, but also looking at online uh, activity. So it's basically a multi-channel multi uh, tool. And uh, there are two, so, so from the lens of the physical stores, as you can see from the video, the main element in this tool is, uh, is uh, geographical maps. So from the lens of the physical stores, you can monitor, you can do two main things. One, it's uh, a descriptive uh, activity, so you can monitor the performance of physical stores and also online activity, uh, so multi-channel and multi-brand. But also, it's a predictive tool because um, you know, we, have models, we have optimization models in the background, and what the tool does, it becomes a strategic tool because it really uh, helps you uh, decide you know, what's a good location uh, for opening a new store and what, what's the impact, uh, what, you know, so what, what you should expect in terms of sales from opening a new store in a specific location for both, from both the physical store and from online sales. And also it, uh, you know, informs uh, your strategies about store closure. So what's the impact from closing a specific store location not, uh, um, not just from the store itself, but also from online activity from all the customers that uh, live in the area. So, and as you can see here, it's, we use data lakes uh, also because there is, uh, we, we use data coming from uh, multi-sources. So it's not just data about, it's not just transactional data, but we overlay that information with uh, customer data. So, you know, we, we have some customer demographics um, that can help us profile the shoppers. And this view, uh, this gives you an example of, uh, you know, multi-channel and multi-brand capabilities. So you, you, we have four views. We have a store map that tells you um, about the physical location. We, ha we have uh, a view for online activity, a view for competitive location, and a view for st uh, st store customer map. And this is the view that it's powered by the machine learning um, models that basically help you decide, you know, where is a good place to open a new store or what's the impact from, from a store closure. So that was an example. I believe it's a good example because it touches basic, basically all the, all the points in the, in the uh, technical framework that we talked about. So data lakes, machine learning, and self-service tools. Another, uh, the other use cases that I want, use case that I wanted to tell you about, it's more specific about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, so how did we leverage all the tools, all the computing tools that um, uh, the AWS offers uh, for um, you know, machine learning and AI? So here the goal, this is called Project Leonardo. The goal here was to uh, optimize inventory allocation. So how do you optimize inventory allocation of finished goods in the stores? Uh, and you know it's basically powered by two main uh, analytics. So forecasts, obviously you have to forecast sales, and then based on the forecast, you can optimize the inventory. Um, you can optimize the allocation of, of the inventory into specific locations. So it's a model that runs uh, at a SKU and uh, store level. So a lot, lot of data. So obviously there are two fa there, there are two main phases. Uh, um, for this, uh, the first one is model training, right? So we, we built and trained the model. Uh, for that, we used two main uh, AWS um, components. So we use obviously AWS uh, S3, 
Uh, so the data lakes, all the data that we use to train a model are stored in S3, and we use uh, SageMaker. So, um, you know, SageMaker is a great tool. You can do different things with, with it. I, in our case, for this use case, we use, so we built the model from scratch using Python, uh, but then we, uh, we leveraged uh, SageMaker to optimize the, the hyperparameters of the model. So, and that's where SageMaker comes very handy because, you know, imagine if you have to do it manually, you basically have to try all the possible combination of the model parameters, and then you may even not find what's the optimum um, hyperparameters combinations because you're just doing it manually. So SageMaker does all that for you. Uh, that's what we use SageMaker for in the training phase. Then once the model was trained and tested, we were ready, we, we were ready for deployment. And then for deployment, you know, it's a combination of um, uh, Redshift, all the model parameters are stored into Redshift, AWS Lambda that kicks the model uh, automatically on a daily basis to produce the weekly predictions. And then, so basic, and then all the weekly predictions are automatically feeding uh, the existing uh, tapestry allocation system. So um, the model basically runs in the background. So this is an example where the user doesn't even see uh, what's going on. The model runs in the background and all the predictions are automatically fed into the allocation system. But we are pr what we are planning to do is also to build a UI where the user can play with different scenarios by leveraging um, the SageMaker API. So SageMaker uh, gives uh, very cool API uh, capabilities where you basically inputting different uh, predictors you can automatically get uh, predictions for different different scenarios. So that's what we are planning uh, to do. Uh, so that's about it for me. And uh, hand it over to Paul now. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Fabio. Okay. So that was a really cool UI that you guys built, by the way. I thought that was. Okay. I love that sort of zoom in on the the geography there. Um, what I wanted to do is actually kind of extend Fabio's talk about where, where the, what they're doing with Leonardo, Project Leonardo, and, and talk a little bit about how would you as a, as a retailer think about continuously training models. So if you're continuously getting data off your systems and you want to automatically uh, retrain your models, redeploy them for new prediction purposes, uh, this is kind of a, a quick deep dive into how you might approach that. And so the high-level architecture is composed of these, these core services. And the idea here is that if you look all the way to the right, you've got Amazon S3. So this is really the data lake, right? So this is where your data is coming in. And what we want to do is uh, react to new data. So as new data comes in, we want to uh, update our models and then create new prediction endpoints, uh, which SageMaker uh, provides services for. And we can use uh, a serverless approach to this by using AWS step functions, which are really just a long-running workflow, managed workflow system. These, this uh, is a way to orchestrate Lambda code uh, is generally what people use it for. And so uh, we'll, we'll look at this architecture in kind of a, a deep dive uh, demo here in just a second. Uh, but the step function is really what's going to sort of respond to data that's changing and then orchestrate over SageMaker to, to build the new model and publish the new endpoint. And then we want to expose that endpoint uh, to our consumer applications. And a lot of customers generally wrap the SageMaker prediction endpoint through API Gateway because it has their common authentication and authorization scheme that they use on their, their gateway. So uh, if we click into the uh, example here for retail, uh, I'll just give you a sense of what, uh, or it's just a real simple, simple demo here. But if you, if you imagine, uh, a spreadsheet with a lot of data about stores and items. So items would just be like a like an SKU, uh, and then demand over over a historical day, right? So uh, you could click down into a given store and a given item. There's so much demand, and so if we ha we have like five years worth of data here in this particular spreadsheet. And the idea is, if you know, as more data comes in, we would drop this uh, new spreadsheet, or it might be some other format for your actual system onto S3, and then that would kick off uh, a step function. And so let's take a look at what is a step function. What does that look like? So you can actually look at a step function in the AWS console. There's a, there's a visual um, sort of way to, to view this. 
And I'm just uh, clicking into this. I've called it retrain, so to, to retrain data. And essentially, it's a state machine. So it's uh, like a directed graph that you're able to build. And you do this through like a JSON document that sort of describes how, how it all is stitched together. But if I kind of zoom in here, each uh, box uh, essentially represents a step function, or a, excuse me, a lambda function. So like I'm starting by setting some default values in the, in the, the context that's moving through here. And then I'm going to submit a training job. I'm going to transform some of the data. Like I need to take that CSV file and transform it into the, the format that the algorithm needs. And so you can do all this in a sequential mode or even parallel. And then at one point, I need to like submit the job to SageMaker, and then I need to wait. So there, that's what that little loop was. You're, you're waiting for things to happen, and then you can respond. And eventually, you get to the point where you want to either publish a new version of your model or just create a new endpoint. So that's kind of where this, this step function stops. We could totally extend this and do like hyperparameter optimization, have a step there that like figures out the best model and then promotes that. But we're just going to keep this one kind of simple. So I'm going to click down uh, just to give you a sense of like what does this look like at the code level if I'm writing code that I need to use to orchestrate over things like uh, S3 and, and uh, SageMaker. First of all, there's a what I, I just calling it a context object. This is really the the state that's moving through your state machine, and so you can you know some of these properties are things like what's the training uh, image that I need to use, what's the the source of some of the data that's coming in, and this is an example of a lambda function that's setting some defaults. So I'm just going out to the parameter store, getting some default values which uh, I've set, and then I be able to set that and then move on to the next step. So this is sort of chaining little lambda functions together to build up my context object that's, that's flowing through my long running workflow. And then uh, we can kind of uh, click down into some of the other functions here. I've just got like a different class for each function. One of them I'm going to uh, go into is the one that actually does the um, submission of the, the training to SageMaker. And so if we look at how this is built, um, we essentially have a reference to the SageMaker API. That's what that SageMaker uh, client is there. And then we're going to basically call the method create training job on there. So we're taking in our context object, which has a lot of the properties that we want to pass into the training job, which we got from like previous steps. So um, this is how we're able to automatically send stuff in. And so you can see here we're describing like, how long should this thing run? What, what kind of horsepower do I need in terms of um, instance sizes? And then we've got some hyperparameters, which are the, the parameters you provide to your algorithm. And then uh, we need to tell it, where, do you, where should you publish the model when you're done? And so all of this stuff just happens in this one function. And then when that is uh, finished, we just return that context object back, and it continues to flow through that, uh, that step function. OK, so I just wanted to quickly show you uh, one more step in this step function. There's a transform data function, which is uh, basically going to look for the, the source file, which is that CSV file we looked at, right? So that's coming in. And this is actually a view of the context object serialized as JSON. So you, you can actually see this context moving through your state machine uh, visually through this, this graphical editor. Uh, so that's the source file, and then what we want to do in that step is actually do the transformation, which might be like done through an EMR cluster, or in this case, it, if it fits within a Lambda function, you can just simply do it there. That's what I'm doing here. And then I want to write that back to S3. S3 is a good, like, durable store to just store state as you're moving things around. And so I'll zoom into S3. And this training.json file is the result, it's the output of one of those Lambda functions. So all, all I'm showing this for is to show you, like, okay, we've, we've transformed some data, and now it's ready to be consumed by the algorithm. And I know this is kind of weird looking, but that's what the algorithm wants the data to look like. So we've uh, transformed it from CSV to this format. And then, uh, you know, th we let that, that uh, step function continue to do its thing, which is basically it does its training, publishes the model, and then deploys a new endpoint, which we can then use to do some prediction. And so this is just like a real simple UI that 
really only does two things. You can load historical data, so you can query that CSV file and bring back rows from that spreadsheet directly. And then you can load the forecast, which is actually going to SageMaker to uh, pull the, the, the next 90 days of data. So what I just clicked here was load history. And uh, what I'm actually doing is sending a select statement to S3. This is a feature on S3 called S3 Select, where you can actually query uh, an actual spreadsheet. It's kind of cool. You can query JSON or CSV. So if you have a huge file, it's easy to just bring back that, those rows of interest. So uh, this is just showing some different um, stores and items that uh, have some historical data. This is store number five, item number 17. But what I want to do next is load the forecast for that particular store and that particular item. And so you can see I just hit the invocation button and I sent it, uh, you know, number 17 and number five. And then it, so it went through API Gateway back to the SageMaker prediction endpoint. And then it returned the forecast, which you're seeing in red there. So that's all the new data or the, the forward looking data coming, coming from SageMaker based off of the, the, the train model. So if we just change, change a different, uh, different store and item combination, load, load up the historical data, then we load up the forecast. And so you can see that the forecast will be different based on the store and item. And then uh, just one more look at how that uh, API Gateway Lambda was implemented. It's essentially just, just this simple. You basically take in those input parameters and then you send them to SageMaker. And so SageMaker has a SageMaker runtime uh, API that's, and then the method is called invoke endpoint. You send it in the, the parameters and then it sends you back uh, the, the predictions. So in this case, I'm getting back 90, 90 days worth of uh, predictions. And then finally, uh, to sort of apply that continuous learning, there's a number of ways you could do that, but one simple method is uh, you can listen for an event in, in AWS using CloudWatch. And if the event is just as simple as new data is dropped on S3, you can stitch up a rule that says, okay, whenever new data is dropped, I want to kick off uh, a step function. And so in this case, we can kick off the retrain step function to go ahead and retrain the, the whole thing and deploy the new model. And so uh, that was a very quick kind of walkthrough on an example of uh, building a continuous training model. And with that, I think we have time for some questions. So I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Is there one one over here? Yeah. That's earlier. So I think the question was, uh, can you crawl other people's data? Uh, yeah. Uh, so Glue, so S3 has ways to, or IAM supports cross-role um, capabilities. So you can access other people's data if they authorize you to. Yep, so that is possible. Um, and that's usually uh, how you would implement a, a pattern like getting access to someone else's data. Is there a published catalog where I can uh, see what data is uh, available? There uh, are public data sets available, but Amazon as such will not share any kind of uh, data. I don't, I don't think I know of any. No, data, not data, but is there a metadata? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a, a public metadata catalog of data sets to, to purchase or, or share at, at this time, yeah. SageMaker does yeah, have some yes, samples yes. built into notebooks. There's um, a, that's true. There's some universities that publish uh, data sets that can be utilized, but not like a catalog that you can actually go in and choose from.
any other a question. question. Uh, say it again, sorry, the last uh, Yeah, so I think the question is, uh, you built your model using Python from scratch, so how big of an effort was that? Uh, so I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was, it's a big effort. It's probably, you know, building and training the model, it's probably, I would say, the biggest uh, step in, uh, in building a model. <laughs> And uh, because you know you go through, you know you go through. First of all, you need to you you, you go through a lot of data cleaning. Uh, so you need to uh, you need to identify what are the variables that are more predictive. So there is there is probably a lot of feedback loop where you keep building and refining, building and refining, building and refining because. At the end of the day, it's a predictive model. So we, you want to identify which are the best predictors for, in this case, forecasting sales. So there is a lot of feedback between uh, cleaning the data, preparing the predictors, and testing them. And then once you have a model that you, you believe to be pretty strong, you have to run actual experiments on the field. Um, but I would say building the actual model is probably 80% of the effort. What's a typical team breakdown of like ML engineer, data scientist, data engineer, analyst? Yeah. How, how is your team Yeah, it's a great question. So, so the question is how do you, how is your team structure? So, uh, so our specific team, we have four main groups. Uh, so we have data engineers, which are obviously the, the people that take care of ingesting and transforming data. So identifying the data, ingesting them, and transforming them and storing them into more or less structured databases, but also are the people that, s that set up all the QC and test in place to make sure that those data come in without problems. Then we have data scientists, which are the, the people specialized in building models and predictive analytics. Then we have um, a product team, because as you saw, we want to build platform, self-service platform. So we have a team that is focusing on building the tools, the self-service tools, which is basically the, the client-facing uh, aspect of everything, right? And then we have a, we have a cons what we call the consulting, uh, consulting group, which is basically the people that are more client-facing, more than anybody else, that, you know, they're, they're the people that have more experience in translating uh, data into actionable insights, and they are the one that usually deliver and presents the insights to the clients. What was the question? Yeah, um, I was going to ask, uh, how, how are you capturing data from social media, um, like Facebook or Twitter, or so you can actually put that into the data lake and analyze everything? Yeah, so, so there are different kind of data for social media, I would say. I, so. I would say the main two kind are your marketing data. So obviously, as many other companies, we run a lot of marketing uh, activities on social media. Um, so there is the marketing data, so all the campaign data, and that we capture them through the API that the social media platform provides. And then there is, um, there is all, you know, all the engagement uh, data, so the likes, the comments, so those, we capture them through our pages. So we have, uh, you know, Coach uh, Facebook page, for example, Kate Spade and Stuart Weitzman, and the same on, you know, the main social media uh, platforms. So we, we capture from our own page, and then, you know, you, there are different things you can do with them. Obviously, for the mar from the marketing side, there is a, there is a lot you can do by uh, looking into media mix optimization, and then on the other side, when it comes to engagement, you know, you want, to, you want just to measure engagement. You can do a lot of natural language processing to measure the sentiment of, um, of the engagement. Yep. Yeah, 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 sure, go ahead. So Amazon uses the same services that the customers use to build any of uh, our recommendation engines. We use the same building blocks. 
So uh, we use uh, similar uh, services like Kinesis to actually capture the information that is coming from social media. The Kinesis uh, uh, streaming, uh, can, uh, you can actually uh, even uh, uh, transform the data as it's coming in and before you land it somewhere like Firehose, you can take the data and put it immediately in the data lake. So Amazon uses the same methodology that we offer to other customers. Uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, how long did it take to, to build? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's that's true. So it took three months, not just for the data lake. Uh, so basically, it took three months to build the entire cloud infrastructure. Uh, you know, uh, obviously we keep enhancing it as we go, yeah. but the main uh, baseline we did it in three months. It was basically uh, building the the virtual private cloud, and then the subnets within it. Um, you know the Tableau server on in the on the EC2, uh, setting up SageMaker, and then most importantly, you know, setting up the VPN connection. Uh, you know, it's a private cloud connected through a VPN, uh, and then also so that's the infrastructure. And then for the data, we also started transferring um, within three months. We basically transferred the entire uh, data um, into the data lakes and into Redshift. So uh, the first phase was uh, uh, f um, a, a, an entire data dump. So actually, I forgot, I forgot to mention, I meant to mention it during the presentation, but the first data dump was done through a service that uh, Amazon offer, the AWS offers that is called um, Snowball. So basically, they literally send you a device where you load all your data and then you ship it back to Amazon. And that, that was the first phase. And then after the first data dump, we set up a set of ETL processes in place using mainly Python running on uh, EC2 and Lambda. We also use Glue for some of it. And so basically, it's a daily process where uh, automatically you pick up the new raw files f that gets dropped into S3, transform them, and store them into Redshift. So all that infrastructure and then data transfer to three months. And then uh, to answer your question about engineers, so we obviously closely worked with IT, especially when it came for, to the infosec and security aspect of it. So, you know, it's a, it was a combination of using our own engineer from the team, but also working uh, closely with IT. Um, So the data engineers, uh, they mainly focus on data. So they basically use, uh, you know, p mainly Python, and and we'll start using some PySpark at some point, maybe Databricks. So uh, the application itself was, was it built by IT? Or? No, no, no. We built everything. Everything is built in my team. IT helped a lot by setting up the infrastructure, and also, you know, they help a lot by maintaining it. Yeah, it's all built in house. Yes. Two questions. One is um, if you look at the overall sort of end to end process, which is identifying the data source, bringing the data in, architecting, provisioning all the servers, and keeping it up and running. And then, sort of from that point, also doing the handoff to the data scientist and the visualization. How much of a percentage is the first bit? Sort of to the point where the data science is. Yeah. So I'm going to answer the first question. For the second question, I prefer to take it offline. I can answer it after um, because it's a little bit more confidential. So the first question is um, sorry, I forgot the question. What was How it? much of a percentage? Uh, yeah. So so it re so I don't think I have an answer to that question because it really depends on the use case. So we. My philosophy is to start from the use case. So you don't really start from the data. You don't collect data for the sake of it. You collect data because you are 
trying to solve a problem. So depending on the use case, that percentage that you're asking about can vary. So for example, for the, the, the allocation model that we are building, that exercise started in the data science team. So the first thing that we did was to build a model. Then that model became a tool and then a following step was to hand it over to the production team. But for other tools like Falcon, it's starting with the product team. So it really depends on the use case. All right, I think we're at time, so we're happy to take more questions offline though. Thank so thank you. you.